All right, so we're back to Flugelhorn today, despite the fact that I'm wearing the same shirt that I was wearing in the last video. <laughs> I don't mean to sound, uh, you know, like I have lack of hygiene, but sometimes I'll wear the same shirt more than once. <laughs> Perhaps you can relate. Anyway, today, and, and apologies for my voice, I'm not really sure what's going on. I'm not sick, but <clears throat> I must be talking too much at work. Uh, I don't know, you know, just as a tangent, I had a bunch of open heart surgeries uh, in 2014, 14, yeah. So about 10 years ago now. Actually, in March it'll be 10 years. So, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm glad that uh, somebody looked out for me and, and I made it through that. But I have nodules on my vocal cords because uh, when they ram that friggin', you know, tube down your throat, I had to have it done twice, back to back, sadly. But you know, it all worked out. Um, Anyway, long story short, uh, my voice gets really irritated really easily. So I, I don't have a lot of longevity with my speaking voice. Uh, so if I get into calls with people at work for like, you know, hour or so, uh, I'm often the windbag that you hear here in, uh, in my work environment as well. So <clears throat> you can well imagine that I, I talk a lot. So I think maybe my voice is a little hoarse. But anyway, <laughs> I digress. I wanted to talk about my, mm, man, I really dig this horn. I'm just really kind of getting more and more into this thing. This is the uh, Brass Fire 933-2B. I don't know if you can see that on here. Eh, kinda. Oh, wait. Uh, Brass Fire, yeah, I don't know. Can you see that? Yeah, I guess it doesn't matter. But they do kind of like a little very mild etching on, on the side of the bell. Uh, and there's not a whole lot of markings. There's like a serial number and stuff like that, but <clears throat> nothing else. But what I wanted to say was, uh, maybe I'll do a video about this, this horn being, uh, you know, what it is and, and all that fun stuff, because I, I don't know how uh, popular they are, but uh, I dig them quite a bit. I think they're, they're pretty cool. But what I wanted to talk about was mouthpieces for the flugelhorn that are in tune versus not in tune. And this is kind of a, a controversial thing, more so with flugelhorns than with trumpets. So excuse me one, I'm going to talk about some technical stuff on a horn, but you know, I may not use the correct jargon, uh, so please forgive me for any of the wrong things I'm about to say. But the receiver on a flugelhorn, right? This piece right here that goes in and out, that's your tuning slide on a flugelhorn. Uh, very much like the tuning slide on a trumpet is in the front, right? That big, you know, it's typically would be this thing would move back and forth to get it in tune. Well, on a flugelhorn, it's this piece right here. And, you know, lo and behold, and I probably should look this up and, and do some research on it, but Whoever invented or started building flugelhorns, uh, because this really isn't a trumpet, I think it's it's clo more closely related to like a euphonium or, or something like that, like a, a soprano euphonium than a trumpet. But nevertheless, it's in the key of B flat and it's got three valves, so it's pretty simple uh, from an amateur perspective to, to blow through this as a trumpet player and just be able to play it or a cornet player. Um, but my point is that this particular aspect is very random. Uh, well, not random, I shouldn't say. It, it's very subjective, right? So depending on the manufacturer that made your horn, this particular receiver piece can be extremely different. Uh, there are some standards. So you have the large Morse, the small Morse, and then the uh, like the French taper, which is for like the Quinot type horns. Um, all that really means is this ferrule or this, this entry point is a certain inside diameter that is made for a specific mouthpiece. Now, you know that with a trumpet, if the mouthpiece doesn't sit in there correctly, you have intonation problems, right? As, especially as you go up and down the range, it can get wildly out of control. So with a flugelhorn, it's even worse because a lot of times you're using mouthpieces that don't really work properly but fit okay in the wrong kind of taper or the wrong kind of ferrule that's on the end of the receiver. So a lot of times a mouthpiece you'll think will work, but when you go to play it, it's wildly out of tune. And one of the reasons is it's not seated the way that it's expected to be. And now, of course, this thing's gonna come apart on me, right? There, there we go. So depending on how far the mouthpiece descends into the receiver, you know, it is, I don't know, I'm not good enough to do this, but I watched Adam Rappa do this and he was buzzing a, a specific note on the mouthpiece and then he placed it in the horn and it was the exact note. So with a flugelhorn, I'm not sure that that's as easy to do simply because if you don't have the correct mouthpiece shank in the correct receiver, 
you know, so this is designed, this one specifically is supposed to be the large taper. So the Yamaha or the large Morse taper, which is the more considered the standard. There's a Bach taper, the small Morse taper, which is what Bach flue horns come with. And then again, there's the French taper. And then there's, I'm sure there's some custom stuff out there that it, it is whatever it is for the manufacturer. Like I would imagine Monette does whatever they do because you install a mouthpiece from them on their horn. Uh, but perhaps they give you that option when you purchase from them as well. But this, I didn't have a choice. This is just what the receiver was that came with it. So you have to tune it. But what I found, and I was just doing this because I have my, you know, I got all this crazy tech here, right? But you know, I got this old fashioned carry along in your trumpet case, Korg tuner. And I, you know, this isn't the one I had as a kid, but this is the exact same one I had as a kid. Like, like, I mean, this particular one is not 40 something years old, but it's the same exact model. The Korg tuner, the CA30, uh, is the exact same thing that I had when I was a kid. Uh, it lasts seemingly forever with a battery. I mean, I don't even remember the last time I changed this and it just keeps on going. But the point or the takeaway today is it's really important to, if you don't have perfect pitch, like I do not, like I can hear when something's flat or sharp, but I can't tell you the note. So I don't have perfect pitch. But the, the, the important takeaway is that it's really critical that you, not necessarily every time you're playing, but as you play, periodically you really need to play across a tuner and see what a mouthpiece that you like actually does from the tuner's perspective, right? So it might play well, feel well, and I, I, you know, I've done tons of videos talking about that, but I've left out perhaps the most important piece. Does it play in tune, right? So if the mouthpiece sounds great and the, the tone that comes out is great, but everything you're playing is flat or sharp, then it's not really useful. And again, keep please keep in mind that the kind of thing that I'm doing is really not good advice if you're gonna go play live. Right? Like I've said before, I record everything, right? That, that's what I am. I'm a studio musician. I mean, that's a ridiculous thing to say. I'm not a professional studio musician, but from classification perspective, that's all I do. I play in the studio, right? And my studio being my home uh, and my computer. Uh, but, you know, in today's technolo technological landscape, that, that's equivalent to, a, you know, a yesteryear million dollar studio is in a friggin' box now. Um, and it sounds amazing. So I'm a studio musician, studio player. That being said, I have a lot more opportunity to get something right than somebody that's playing live in a combo or in a live setting where you get one shot, you either get it or you don't. So in this case, I don't want you to take my advice too strongly if you don't do what I do. And, and it's probably worth calling out that from a contextual standpoint, you really should not really listen to what I'm saying unless you're doing literally what I'm doing. Uh, simply because it's not applicable. You know, if you go play live and you get all these musicians playing and they're all in tune and you're not in tune, well, you're going to sound terrible even if you are a great player. So I think it's important that you, you know, remember that. And, and also, you know, I was just, I have this obsession where I, I just literally keep going over mouthpiece after mouthpiece and which one works, which one doesn't. And, and I'm sure I'm doing the wrong thing by doing that. I should just pick one, stick with it and just stop doing this uh, because I'm not really settling on anything. And I'm certainly not a good enough player where I'm capable of switching between all kinds of different equipment. Like literally switching from this horn to trumpet, it takes me a couple of notes before I get the feel of the, the trumpet without popping or cracking notes. So it's not this perfect transition that I'll make. But again, that isn't a problem for me because I just stop recording, warm up, get ready, and then go. It's not like I'm in the middle of a song or switching from one song to the next and then grabbing a flugel or a trumpet or a cornet or a piccolo or something else and having to change and immediately be spot on, I don't have to do that again. But I found it very interesting that some of the mouthpieces that I really like that I've talked about on here are not in tune for this particular horn as you go up and down the scale. And this weird Diorio that I got, it's a Diorio 5. It's a two-piece modular, so it, you know, it comes apart. And, and I, I have a bunch of tops and, and, uh, uh, stems, throats, whatever these are called, the backboard piece down here, that I can swap these things in and out because the threading is all the same on them, which is one of the cool things about having a modular mouthpiece is you could get a, a, one backboard and then just buy a whole bunch of tops. Um, and Diorio, I don't know, I came across them some time back 
And I'm not sure why it was just like, hey, I had not heard of that. Let me buy it. It was like 50 bucks online. And now I have like 10 of them. And so I can do all this interchanging and swapping of tops and, and bottom pieces and try all this different stuff out. But anyway, this particular gold model, uh, it's a Diorio 5 uh, uh, screw top mouthpiece. And it doesn't appear that it's sitting in there really well or correct. Um, maybe I can show you what I mean. Like... Uh, so yeah, this is a good example actually. So here, because I have a lot of parts for my Shilkies too, right? So, because they're an awesome company. And when I had a problem with one of my lead pipes or one of my uh, receivers, they just sent me new ones. Like awesome customer service by, just amazing. Anyway, this is the L, I don't know if you can see that. See, it says LT, large taper. So large Morse taper. So this mouthpiece is designed for this particular taper. So we can see that that thing fits almost flush. Pretty cool. This is the small Morse taper. Now, literally, these things are exactly the same except for the end piece, right? I mean, everything about this is the same. Oh, sorry, there's crap all over this thing. About these, the, the outside diameter of, of the actual part that goes into the horn is identical. The only difference is the ferrule on the, you know, this, this piece that's soldered on, the ferrule that's on the outside is, has a different inside diameter. So if we go now to the small Morse taper, see how much further that thing sticks out? I'll show you again. So large Morse, almost perfectly flush, small Morse, not even close. And then if I go back to the horn that we were just talking about, we can see that that one <laughs> looks like the large, but it's actually sticking out just a little bit more <laughs> than the Shilky large Morse taper. So again, we, we kind of run into this where there is a standard that's set forth for large Morse, Morse, small Morse tapers, but they're not always actually standard. It depends on, I guess, the horn that you that you have. So this particular horn with this particular mouthpiece and the way that it inserts into the receiver plays all the way up to high C in perfect tune. And that was shocking to me because um, if I put some other mouthpieces in here, it's just not even close. Um, some of these notes are extremely sharp in the mid-range register. And then as you go up, they get flat, which is more normal, right? Um, and then others I have that are extremely... Uh, on in the mid range range and then as you go up they become uh flat and then like an f sharp for example in the regular register is fine but in the upper register is extremely sharp you know just really and and you might think well it's the horn but it, but it really isn't right because if if that were the case then no matter what mouthpiece i put in here you would get a sharp f sharp or a flat f sharp you know whatever the case it would be consistent is the point it would have nothing to do with the mouthpiece. It would be that if it was the horn being the problem, it would be that anything you put in here and blow through it and a high F sharp would be flat or sharp, right? But that's not the case. It, it seems to be random throughout the whole thing. So kind of an interesting find. I don't know if you find that as interesting as I do, but I thought it was kind of a revel revelation in a way only because I wasn't expecting that. And I guess my ear was playing tricks on me. And now keep in mind that when I do recordings, I can go in and, and uh, convert, uh, like if I wanted to print out a score, because I shot, you know, you're like, why would you do that? Well, sh believe it or not, I have a song that was put out in 2018, I think. It's called Tarumi. And it's got, you know, uh, I mean, just on Spotify, I think it's got almost 8 million plays. So it's, you know, it's pretty decent size. And, and you know, a lot of, it's on like two or 3,000 playlists. You know, it's, it's, it's a real thing, right? And it's made a good amount of money. Just maybe I should do a video about that in case any of you are interested in why I do some of the recordings that I do is because there's actual money that can be made doing this. Uh, but, it, you know, aside from that, my point is, uh, I don't know what my point is now. Does this happen to you guys? Like you start talking about something and you go off on a tangent and then you lose your train of thought. Maybe that's a, an old guy thing. You know, I'm getting older now and I'm, <laughs> I'm starting to lose my, my marbles up here and you know, I try to keep active and, and stay on time. Look at I'm doing it again. I'm like way off in left field. <clears throat> anyway, I, I you know, I have a, a song that's done really well. Um, and, I, I, you know, I think it's hysterical. And this is why I don't edit my videos, because 
I want my kids and, and you know family and, and even myself to go back and laugh at this because it's so funny that I literally have no idea what I was just talking about. <laughs> no matter how much I stall or try to think about it, I don't know where I was going with any of that. And man, that happens to me all the time. And it's really annoying, um, especially in, in a professional environment when you're talking to people that are, you know, you're trying to give them information and all of a sudden you're like off in la la land talking about something else. You're like, hmm, where was I? What was I talking about? Uh, but you know, and anyway, I guess that's all I'll say about this for today. Uh, but the real takeaway was just make sure that you're in tune when you're playing these things because it's, um, Oh, you know what I was, now I know, I was doing sheet music. So you're like, well, how would you know you're so out of tune if you can't hear it, right? So inside of Logic, which is what I use Logic Pro as my recording studio, you can convert audio files to MIDI and then convert MIDI into a piano roll, which allows you to print out a score. <clears throat> so in doing that, when you convert something, it turns all of your playing into, you know, representational, uh, like dots and stuff on the screen, on the computer screen. So it'll show me where things are flat and sharp. So I can see when I play in my recording sessions where I'm flat and sharp. And, and, and you know, that's another way I, that helps me tune. But, you know, if you don't have something like that, um, it's very nice just to have one of these, like, tw I bet this thing is like 20 or 30 bucks. Maybe I should go look it up. But it's probably like 20 or $30. And you just have it with you and it works wonders. And it's, it's a real nice checkpoint to just be able to make sure that you're in tune and that the mouthpiece that you've chosen really works for you and, and is performing the way you want it to. And you don't sound wildly out of tune, man. I, I was watching a video earlier today. And one of the reasons that, you know, I guess I'm kind of a douchebag in a lot of ways, like I'm, I'm super critical of things. And, and that's perhaps why I think I suck is because, you know, I measure myself against a guy like Mar Wynton Marsalis, you know, I was about to say Marsalis Wallace. <laughs> oh, anyway, um, and in that regard, I mean, you know, obviously that guy's perhaps the best trumpet player to have ever lived. I mean, he's just can do it all. Um, but you know, I have lofty goals like that. I, I like to believe that I'm, I'm capable of something like that, even though, you know, it's just unrealistic, but that's the kind of the standard that I have. I've always been like that with everything I've done that I, you know, I really try to be the best, the very best that I can be. Uh, but unfortunately, some of the side effect of that is that you don't really think that highly of yourself because I'm never going to really reach that goal. Uh, and the, what I do end up achieving is lesser than what I had set out to. And while you can classify that as a win, certainly it's not what I was hoping for. So I have kind of a, a mental block around that, that whole thing. Um, you know, and, and I guess that's just me, but perhaps you guys feel that way too about some of this is it's being a little overcritical of, of, of everything. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about that's really off topic here, but it was something that, that I, I thought was interesting that I thought about it today. So I've been in a bunch of bands over the years and, you know, somebody mentioned, yeah, I got a whole boatload of guitars. I mean, you can't see them. They're like all the way down the back of this room. Um, for no reason other than, you know, I love guitars and, and it's fun to play. But I'm kind of, you know, get this, right? So I'm a punk rock guitar player. <laughs> I've been in a few bands and, you know, I've put out some CDs and, and done some stuff on in that regard too because everything that I do in the studio, I do by myself, right? So it, while that's great and, you know, for someone like me who's extremely self-driven, um, I can get a lot done by myself. You know, but I'm always of the opinion that, wow, wouldn't this be great if I had somebody else that played the piano and somebody else that played the bass and somebody else that played the guitar that was just better, right? You know, being an all around, like I've said this before, you know, th there's very few people that can really do that extremely well. You know, songwrite, produce, mix, master, sing, write the lyrics, you know, arrange the song, play all the different instruments, you know that's a pretty tall order, right? And I'm just, like I said, just a regular dude. So I'd love to just focus on the horn. I've never been able to put a horn band together where I could go play trumpet with, with some band. And again, I'm not really much of a jazz player. So what I'd be doing is extremely, you know, unique type stuff like what I'm doing now. It just would be with real players. Uh, but it's kind of hard to find that because uh, where I live, I guess that's just not a very popular thing. But I've been in a few punk rock bands and I don't know what's going on lately. I've gotten a couple offers to go meet up with some guys and, and start another project, and I just don't want to do it. Anybody else out there feeling kind of like unmotivated like that? I would think that, you know, after COVID and, and all this crap, and I, I may have mentioned that, you know, I'm a remote 
uh, engineering manager, so I, I work out of my house. I don't go into an office. I don't interact with people uh, person to person. It's all virtually, right? Which, you know, I have no problem with that, again, because I'm very driven and, and have a lot of motivation. But at the same time, I'm almost wondering if that's been detrimental to my mental health in the sense that, like, I don't want to go out and do anything with people anymore. Um, I, I, get, I have this really weird feeling. Like, you know, I've committed to it. And, yeah, we're going to get together this Thursday was the idea. And, and then I'm like, ah, I don't really want to do this. And then every time I go and do it, I have this sense and feeling of regret. I don't know if there's any uh, psychologists out there listening to this. If you got any tips for me, I would really appreciate that because uh, I'm not really sure how to, how to overcome this. And it's it's not debilitating, like I can make myself go. But the problem is I don't want to have to make myself. I want to go because it's fun and that's the point of doing it. it, it it's not something I have to do. It's something I should want to do. And if I don't want to do it, why do I keep saying I want to do it and try to do it and then not do it? weird. So I'm not really sure what that's all about. Maybe I've just been working by myself too long and I'm, I'm just lost my interaction or my, I don't know, something my, my human to human thing is just broke at the moment. But just wondering if anyone else has anything to share on that. You guys have been so wonderful with the comments. I mean, some of the comments I got today were like several paragraphs long. And I, I mean, man, that's so cool. Um, I really wish we could have like live dialogue together. I think and just talk. That would be really cool because I'm at least old enough to remember when people used to do that uh, rather than everything's a friggin' comment or some kind of a video reply that's not live real interaction. And even the live interactions that I watch, like I don't think I have enough followers on these platforms to do that stuff anyway. But you, you're not really interacting. It's like trying to look at a feed of like people saying things and then responding. It's not like you're doing it together. So... Anyway, if you have any thoughts on that, I would appreciate it. And, and you know, remember to uh, make sure you're in tune when you're playing. You know, I always forget to play in these videos now. I'm talking too much. Sorry. So don't don't come, come at me when because I'm talking too much. Here's some playing for you.